Right, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking time out of your uh, day to join us for this Livestock Lecturers webinar hosted by HDB. Um, the purpose of this webinar, um, we've held College Lecturers Days for many years now, at least 10 years plus, but um, obviously with the situation we're in this year, we, we can't be holding a face-to-face -face conference. So we've taken the opportunity to split it into various different sessions, they, um, we obviously had the session this morning and then we've got the livestock one now, um, arable tomorrow and business tomorrow afternoon. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for some more of the webinars and not just this afternoons. Um, I'm Katie Thorley and I work in the beef and lamb knowledge exchange team. And this afternoon we've got a range of topics for you. Um, we've got Ben talking about smart pork, Catherine with um, talking about our grass check project and then Lorna on BVD free. Um, the plan of action is each of the speakers will present to you and then we'll have time for questions after each speaker. So if anything does spring to mind while the presenters are going through their topics, please type in the question panel on the right hand side of your screen um, any questions so that you don't forget them. And then after each speaker, I'll ask those questions to the various speakers. Um, hopefully there won't be any technical issues, um, but if there are, please bear with us. Um, and you will all stay muted throughout the presentation, so it doesn't matter what's going on in the background, wherever you are, um, that's not a problem. I've mentioned about the questions or, you know, if you've got any technical issues, again, just type those into the question panel and if one of us can help you, obviously we will. Um, we aim to finish by half past three and the sessions are being recorded, so if there is anything you need to go back to and recap yourself um, on, then they will be available afterwards on the HDB channel um, on YouTube. If you are a Twitter user, um, the hashtag and the at is at the bottom of the screen. So um, feel free to tweet away and um, do whatever comments you want to do this afternoon. Um, so without further delay, I will hand you over to Ben Williams, who is a knowledge transfer senior manager for our pork team. And he's gonna talk you through smart pork. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Casey. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gents. Yep, I'm going to take you through uh, a new initiative from the pork team, uh, Smart Pork. Um, I'll be honest with you, we've unashamedly stolen some of the concepts from the horticulture team who run a very similar project called Smart Hort. For those of you who are interested in multiple sectors, um, it's worth checking them out as well. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So unashamedly, Smart Pork is um, the use of lean manufacturing techniques to improve efficiency. Um, obviously I need to start with why lean manufacturing in particular because um, there are more than one way to skin a cat. Um, next slide please. Uh, quite simply we as an industry are not as productive as other sectors. Um, I know that production might not be the major driver for, for many farmers. Lifestyle certainly uh, is often cited as their main driver, but at the end of the day, you have to pay for a lifestyle. Lean manufacturing offers um, not only a how-to method to bring entire staff um, along with uh, the management and the vision of a, of a business, but it it works. Unashamedly, lean manufacturing is proven in many, many other industries. Many of those are significantly more productive than agriculture. Lean particularly fits what agriculture does because we are overwhelmingly price takers um, producing a commodity um, product. We have to start with value. The price that we're going to be paid for that product is fixed, as in even if we do start selling meat boxes and various other bits and pieces, there's only so much a consumer will pay for that product. And from that, in order to survive, there are two components that we need to build in. The first is the cost of production, and the second is this concept of economic rent. Both of those, when added together, need to equal the customer value. You can't suddenly create more than the, the value you're being paid for. And it's this concept of economic rent that's really, really important. In simple terms, we might call it profit. In actual fact, it's a measure of the business's survivability uh, in terms of volatile markets, in terms of the ability to innovate, to expand, to develop staff. And so it's more than just profit. What Lean does is it builds the minimization of cost of production through reducing wastes with the maximizing of economic rent to meet that customer value. And it's starting with customer value that is key in Lean manufacturing. 
We also know it works and we know it works in agriculture. So the graph that you can see on the screen is uh, from a pig producer who has been using lean manufacturing techniques to standardize their process for some years. The gray line is their um, performance in terms of firing rates by service group uh, in the period of, of uh, up to 2010. So prior to introducing lean techniques. And you'll see that the volatility is significant, but more importantly, it's below the targeted uh, KPI of 90% of or over that they wanted. The dotted line, the blue line, um, that is their um, performance um, in 2018 after um, successfully introducing lean manufacturing techniques and you can see that the volatility is still there you're never going to get rid of it but it's significantly reduced and more importantly it's largely starting to exceed the KPI that's been set. More powerful still is what happened in 2019 when they were hit with a PERS outbreak on that unit. The volatility did increase as you'd expect with a with a increased production stresses but importantly because they'd standardized their procedures they were following these lean manufacturing techniques the volatility wasn't anywhere near the pre uh, lean processes and more importantly they still managed to perform at or above their KPI on the whole. In short it's an incredibly powerful tool and it works within agriculture. We also know particularly in pigs that if we take no action we are losing money. So guilt retention is a, a, a big issue within pig production in that we have a, a very significant uh, turnover of pigs. Um, that means that out of every 100 pigs that we um, have in a population, we tend to need about 34 replacements. That extra 34 pigs coming in has a significant cost to the industry. And it comes down largely to ineffective maintenance of our machinery. So the sow in, in pig production is that machine. It's the same as a robot in car production or an oven in bakeries. If we don't maintain that machine using uh, not necessarily just lean principles, we're going to continue to hemorrhage that money. And a rough sort of cost for you is between 30 and 60 million pounds worth of lost revenue because of the high rate of, of turnover of, of production animals within the UK pig industry per annum. And that money is lost to production currently. So the big numbers big problems, how does uh, SmartPort work? Well, in short, in the past, we've taken small trials, we've made small changes to production processes. And more often than not, when we look at the large KPIs of sow retention or pigs per sow per year, it's very difficult to measure progress because of that significant volatility you saw in the graphs before. Basically, the, the small progress, those incremental marginal gains get lost within the noise of production. Instead, what's needed to see significant shifts is a process that allows you to build successive marginal gains over time into producing a, a, a big shift in production. In lean manufacturing, there's a process called total productive maintenance. It's, it's the fundamental maintaining of your machinery to prevent breakdowns in the future and to maximize its output. What Smart Pork aims to do is use total productive maintenance to increase the efficiency of our sows. It's a result of extensive work from previous programmes. The Guilt Watch uh, programme was quite publicly uh, discussed, the Eight Kilo Club less so. And what they've done is they've identified the significant total productive maintenance processes needed to support the sound. What we've done is we've done extensive literature reviews, extensive trials, and more importantly, we've checked with producers themselves and industry professionals to see whether or not the changes that they make to the maintenance of a sow are a feasible because we all have good ideas that are not realistic in practice and more importantly are likely to make proven seen uh, differences within the production process. So we now have a bank of go-to tasks. These maintenance schedules for want of a better phrase are going to be implemented across 10 monitor farms in the UK. They'll embed a lean consultant that lean consultant will follow through a mapping of the process and identifying of value within the production process itself with the farms. The farms will then, under the support of the KE teams and the lean specialists, they will identify the waste within that production system. 
they can then pull from the bank of, of known proven uh, effective techniques to try and minimize that waste and embed them over the course of a year. The lean experts will help support the monitoring and tracking of that. The KE team will provide technical input. And at the end of it, importantly, those businesses will have been on a lean journey. The user journey will look very much like this. So we've just finished the recruiting of, of Monitor Farms. We were due to start this month, but with COVID, we've put that back into the new year. And basically there's two tracks, two user journeys. The unit manager themselves is going to undertake six days of lean training between February and May, and that's provided by a recognized training provider. The unit manager and the farm staff are going to map that production process supported by the lean team. The unit manager and the farm staff will carry out the waste walks across specific stages of production. And that's really important because it's the staff that do the job within Lean that know how to make the differences. And it's those staff that Lean empowers to drive up production and performance. And if we go back to that graph I showed at the start, it's been suggested that the reason that UK agriculture isn't as productive is that we don't always engage those staff who do the job with making production changes. Once they've identified those, those wastes and once they've um, identified those, over nine months, they're going to pick one, possibly two areas to really work on, supported by the KE team and the lean experts, and they're going to actually genuinely work to improve those. As they go through, they're going to present those findings to regional pig clubs, and on completion of the project, the unit manager receives an officially recognised lean qualification. Now, that's important because the second user journey is that of the business owner. So they're not going into this uh, alone or unprepared. The business owner is going to undertake a two-day lean event um, supported by ourselves and those lean experts because it's a very lonely thing speaking a strange production language, particularly in, in the middle of a farm. Um, the business owner is going to support with access to data and recording systems, as well as engaging in what we call Kaizen groups, those uh, action groups that will make the changes on the farm. They'll also be part of the management group because we're not moving management from one person to another. There's no delegation of responsibility there. Um, the business owner is going to support in some of those findings going out to the regional pig clubs. But importantly, the business owner is engaging this not just because they want to progress their own business performance, but it's a staff development tool. That recognised qualification helps support that staff member at the end. The lean provider themselves is a chap called uh, Neil Fedden. Uh, and his team at Fed and USP. They have been working in the pig industry for some time now, but they have previous experience across UK sectors and industries, including the horticulture sector. The Smart Hort uh, programme has delivered a return on investment of 12 to 1. So savings of between 20 and 40% across those businesses and between 400 and 600,000 pounds in its first year alone. So lean definitely works and it works in industries that most people have said it shouldn't. How can people get involved? Well, importantly, all of our monitor farms are going to be presenting at the local pig clubs. And at the moment, that is still digital first, but as hopefully we move uh, into sort of times returning to normal, that will be in person at the local pig clubs. Until then, we do have various online resources and we're in the press. So there is a website for this to find out significantly more information, not only about the Smart Pork program specifically, but about lean management and its uh, use and application in agriculture in general. We've got a webinar coming up on the 10th of November. Um, and there is a recently released article for those of you who subscribe to Pig World. And ladies and gents, hopefully finishing on time, that takes us to the point where we open to questions. Thanks, Ben. That was very speedy to go through your ahead of time. Um, so has anyone got any questions? Please type them into the panel on the right hand side of your um, go to webinar panel. Looks like you've stunned them all to silence, Ben. That doesn't surprise me. Lean management does stun many people to silence. It's one of our um, one of our frequent issues. Um, so one of the questions people often ask us is, um, you know, we talk about management, we talk about efficiencies, but obviously there's there's two parts to this. So it's not just about managing process, it's about managing people. So AHDB also has the Agri Leader program, which is very much about people management. And we've included a lot of training uh, around people management and behavioural change within the SmartPort program. And that's that's delivered through AgriLeader, which in its own right is a really worthwhile um, 
thing to sort of follow and, and have a look at the Facebook page of. In the absence of any uh, questions coming from the um, attendees, at will is there a good spread of the monitor farms that you you're rolling this out uh, over the country? And will there be opportunities for lecturers to possibly take students? Obviously, when we're in a more normal world, um, would that be a possibility? So for us, yes, there is a good spread. I mean, as good a spread as there is pig production. So pig production is obviously heavily biased across the uh, across Yorkshire, uh, the east, and, and to a certain degree the south. And so that's where you'll find those pig farms, with a couple of exceptions, with with a few in the Midlands. Um, pig farms being very very high biosecurity. The the way we've designed this is really the pig clubs will be the way to sort of get in touch with those monitor farms. So we'll bring the farmer to the people rather than the people to the farmer, and that's out and out a biosecurity concern at the moment. It's just taking large groups onto farms is, is very rarely feasible within the pig industry. Okay, no worries. Um, questions are now coming in. So have the lean methods been used on beef or in beef or dairy production or could it be used? Um, the short answer is is yes on both counts. So um, I, without casting aspersions about any sector over the other, uptake it varies uh, between the sectors. So dairy has quite a long history with uh, lean, but I would say the uptake is limited. Beef and lamb, there are some really good progressive farmers out there looking and championing lean methods within beef and lamb. Um, and I believe we're looking at having a case study in the new year for a beef and lamb enterprise. Um, COVID unfortunately has delayed some of that. The short answer is lean works. It depends at which level you want to enter do you want to go out full out sort of you know develop this deep-seated lean culture or do you want to take a toe in the water my argument is there is something for everybody but once you've committed you have to commit at that level to see the work through too many people get um sort of bogged down with the details too soon and they don't see it through it's, it's one of those that you really have to push but it will work in any enterprise i mean from central government to healthcare to the automotive industry and god knows what in between they use lean tools and if we go back to that original graph the food and beverage industry is overwhelmingly lean from the processing so the moment you drop the animals in the layerage onwards they are lean and they are several magnitudes of order more productive than we are and it is largely because of that Okay, thank you. Um, how could we introduce the lean messages to to the student audience? <laughs> so uh, many years ago, I wrote a lot of resources under the ETF um, for lean in students, um, and it's it's simple processes. So everything from their practical coursework, um, in fact, actually, it's their practical elements that are best um, written into for lean. So everything from using lean techniques as some of their learning outcomes, some of their evidence for their portfolio work, all the way through to sort of just building in those basic elements of lean um, in some of that core teaching. So process mapping, you know, when you want to give instructions of how to complete a practical task well deliver it as a process map you know this is this is the value you want to achieve completion of this task to this level what are those process steps um, all the way up to in those business modules and enterprise modules using tools like cypox process maps value stream mapping all of those there's lots and lots of tools available um, and i know that the etf certainly had um had some there so um very easily is the short answer I'm sure if, if you email me some stuff over, I've got all sorts of bits and pieces, which if I change the name of a well-known college, um, I might be able to share. I don't think there was an embargo on it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and how do KPIs um, fit into the LEAD initiative? <laughs> so um, I suppose there's two elements to this. The first one is KPI. So um, for lean, we need to distinguish between what is a key performance indicator and what is just a metric that you measure. It's important to measure as much information as you possibly can, but you shouldn't get bogged down in measuring everything. There are really fundamentally four KPIs that you need to look at. One is around finance, because if you're not profitable, what's the point? One is around the health of your enterprise. So that could be um, mortality, that could be a measure of crop health. The other is around fertility, be that soil or herd fertility. And the final one is around yield. If you can't from those four key performance indicators, look at the performance of your business, then you're doing something massively wrong. Um, but they are essential. If, if you can't measure those four basic things, you can't do lean. So people need to be recording stuff, but it, it's about defining what is a key performance indicator, not just measuring stuff because either it makes you look good or because you can. Okay. Um, the next one, I'm just checking with one person whether they, what their question is. Um, 
interest it's the next one is that there's an interesting point um, about people who work in business and their needs to be involved in this to drive up improvement is there also a problem with farmers being shy to share information about what they're doing to drive productivity with other farmers interesting to hear that there are pig groups where this can be done yeah and don't get me wrong it'll depend on sector and sector and region by region so if we i mean obviously i know pigs better than than anything else so if i stick with pigs um pigs is a highly integrated business and there are four or five companies that probably control the vast majority of production do they talk openly all the time very definitely not however their suppliers they will talk in those groups um, but importantly they're still keen to look at lean manufacturing they're still keen to share amongst their production groups so I think the pig industry as much as we've got many closed doors or conversations happening behind closed doors there is still a lot of sharing um, and I still maintain and I think they do if they're being honest the best way to learn is to either steal it from somebody else who's doing it and is doing it well or, or pinch with pride I think is probably the better phrase um, it's it's peer-to-peer -peer learning it, it still has a, a significant place um, and with Smart Hort in particular, it was that peer-to-peer -peer learning that really delivered um, success. And, and again, we, we really are with Smart Hort standing on the shoulders of giants because Chagas have done the same program in Ireland and they saw returns between seven to one and 18 to one. And it was that peer-to-peer -peer element that was so supportive. So going through those pig clubs. So I don't know if that quite answered the question. Short answer is yeah. Okay. Um... The next one is saying that um, there's talk about along the lines of rewilding animals to get them back. Um, it's quite a long one. Do you do you talk to such people to let them know about African swine fever and the risk it brings back to bring back wild boars in case they don't care about the farmed ones? We do. So we we have very long conversations. Our health and welfare team and our veterinary officer have very long conversations with not only those groups, so the the NGOs, but equally with DEFRA Environment Agency, uh, AFA. We have very very strong links with AFA, um, and we are obviously significantly more cautious um, than we are supportive of just uh, introduction rewilding. Um, I mean, it's an interesting one. If we go back to lean, I mean, you could mistake lean for just sort of being out and out about looking at profit. But actually what lean is about is about finding value and, and presenting a really good argument for how you get to that value and there is value sometimes in certain activities um, so value can can work on the, the basis of profit but it can work on what we call the triple bottom line elkington's triple bottom line of, of profit people planet i think ahdv is is very much or hdb pork is very much along that order we look at profit first because without that we don't support the others but actually we do need to assess the values of of each of those particularly i think in in current climate so the short answer again is, is yes we work very very closely um, and we are very resistant to, to certain actions that that jeopardize uh, uk productivity um, but equally i do think that we need to look as particularly as we move to net zero um, and this this uh, public services for public goods um, we need to look at, at how we meet those values profitably. OK, thank you very much, Ben. I don't think there's any more questions unless anybody types something in um, quickly. Then that is the end of the questions for your session, Ben. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, and thank very you much. for your insight into um, Smart Pork. So next um, we have um, Catherine Hurston from who is a research scientist part of our project um, Grass Check, which is at, um, um, at Catherine works at AFBI. Um, so Catherine's going to give you an insight into the Grass Check project. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Catherine. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of the Grass Check project and some of the data that we've seen coming out of that today. Um, before I jump into talking too much about Grass Check GB, I just want to kind of set the scene and give you a bit of background as to where this project originated. Um, so as Katie said, I work at AFBI, so I'm based in Hillsborough in Northern Ireland, and it was uh, AFBI in collaboration with sort of a couple of other organisations that first established the Grass Check project back in 1998. So for that, we have 20 years of continuous data here in Northern Ireland. Um, it was originally set up as a grass growth and quality monitoring project 
with uh, weekly pot monitoring at two, lo two core locations still at the moment. So it's our Agricultural College in Grain Mount in County Antrim and the AFB Research Farm in Hillsborough as well. And these plots are set up to replicate an intensive dairy grazing regime. So they're cut on a 21 day rotation through a March to October grazing season. And um, I think it used to be slightly higher, but now at the moment with MVZ rules coming in, um, they get 270 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. So from that um, long running plot experiment, we have weekly herbage mass and quality measurements. Um, we've also got a Met Office weather station on the Hillsborough farm. So we've got long term weather records um, alongside that. trying to get my next slide there we go and um, so with the long-term data that's come out of that project over the last sort of 20 plus years we've seen an average yield of 11.6 ton off those plots but you can see quite a range in year-to-year -year yields from this study and with the sort of consistent protocols uh, running across sort of the the whole 20-year history we found this a very valuable project for sort of informing policy in relation to sort of grassland agriculture in Northern Ireland. And um, sort of just the most recent example of that would be looking at 2018, where much as the rest of the UK, there was quite a significant summer drought. And um, grass check data was used to sort of provide evidence for the early release of single farm payments so that farmers over here could purchase fodder to feed stock through that summer period. So since uh, 2017, there's been quite a big development of the grass check project. So from that original plot monitoring activity to uh, develop a network, which now stands at 48 co-researcher farms spread across Northern Ireland um, alongside the two plot sites. And so the value of adding that farm network has really enabled us to capture data across, um, across all of the province. Um, and has highlighted some sort of quite significant regional differences in terms of grass productivity and typical grass growth curves. And it sort of really contributes some valuable data to um, KE outputs in terms of having real farm examples when we're talking about yield potentials and those kind of figures. So at the moment, as it stands, um, farm data and plot data go into a, uh, into a weekly bulletin that comes out through the grazing season. So we've got local growth and weather data on there and um, local uh, well, grass quality with the M plus and average daily gain estimates based on sort of some typical stock examples. Um, and in Northern Ireland, we have a grass growth forecasting model that we run as well. So if we look at the Grass Tech GB project, it's a much newer project. Um, began in March 2019 and it's currently funded for three years. So the funding group, uh, you can see the, uh, the logos of everybody involved across the bottom of my slides now, um, but we're including research institutes, the Red Meat Levy Boards, and of course, HDBB from LAM, who've invited me to speak to you today, um, and a number of industry sponsors as well. So the Grass Check GB network uh, includes 50 farms, and these are spread sort of across the country, as you can see on the map. Um, these farms were selected to make sure that we're incorporating a range of different production systems, different land types, and farms with sort of different grass growth potentials, as well as a different sort of management intensity as well. So we have everybody from quite intensive, uh, high yielding lowland dairy farms through to very upland farms, uh, grazing beef or sheep on the mountains, um, and some several sort of organic systems included as well. The sort of project aims from GrassTrack DB, we're really looking to provide a detailed understanding of the grass growth potential across Great Britain, um, looking at sort of the actual variability in grass production utilisation on commercial farms and using that data to try and identify what the key drivers are behind pushing better grass growth and better utilisation in GB. Um, we're also hoping to validate the Northern Ireland grass growth prediction model to use in GB as well. Um, that's something that's sort of ongoing at the moment. Uh, obviously, 
there's sort of research aims to this project, but a key aspect of it is knowledge exchange as well. So through the production of weekly grass growth updates and bulletins and publishing that grass growth and quality data, we're hoping to assist farmers with making uh, grassland management decisions as they move through the season and hoping to provide them with a little bit more data to support those decisions. So in order to sort of produce these outputs and collect data for both research and the KE activities, we are collecting an enormous amount of data through this project. Um, all of the farms involved are taking weekly grass growth measurements across their grazing, grazing platform with uh, rising plate meters. We're also able to collect data on stocking rates and grazing events. And from that, we can calculate grass utilization and any other data to do with receding um, soil health and nutrient management on the farms. And that comes in through the AgriNet platform. All of the farms in the project submit uh, grass quality samples as well. So their, uh, their farms are sampling every two weeks and they do that on an alternating basis. So we get weekly quality values coming in through the season and they all uh, have automated weather stations fitted on farm. And these are sending data packets at 30 minute intervals. So we're getting an awful lot of detailed weather information coming in so that we can really tie up that weather data with, with uh, grass growth and uh, animal data as well. So this is an illustration on the side of the slide here of one of the weekly bulletins for the GB project. Um, if you haven't seen it before, uh, you can find us on Twitter and on our website, grasscheckgb.co.uk. Um, so in terms of, sort of sharing this information, the data coming down from the farms through AgriNet, we collate that along with weather and soil conditions from the on-farm weather stations and the latest grass quality results every week. And we put those into these bulletins. So we're publishing sort of regional average grass growth rates, uh, local sort of weather data and soil conditions over the past seven days as well. And the typical grass quality values that we're seeing coming in. Um, and we're trying to tie those in with sort of management notes, depending on what's going on with the sort of weather conditions, ground conditions and whereabouts we are in the season just to try and guide people as to things that they should hopefully be thinking about at, uh, for each week through the season. So you can find uh, much more detailed information on the Grasstrip GB website. Um, and on the website, we have live feeds to all of our grass check weather stations. So you can see exactly what's going on on your closest one. If you look on, on the map and then go to the weather tab and select the grass check ID for the, for the closest station, you can find up to date weather information for each of those farms. And we also have uh, all of the recordings of webinars that have been done through this season and uh, any farmer focus or any other articles that have been published as part of the project are available on the website as well. So we're really trying to reach quite a broad KE output um, and a broad audience with this project. Uh, with the bulletins, as I said, they're published on Twitter. They're also published in the Farmer's Guardian, which I think has a press circulation of around 29,000 on a weekly basis. Last time I checked, we've got just over a thousand Twitter followers and we set up a new Facebook page just last month. So we're just sort of starting to build followers on that now as well. And um, all of, obviously, and Ben said a few times in the last week, anything that was planned for 2020 pretty much got canceled with COVID in terms of on-farm events. And um, we'd hoped to do some of those this season, but instead we've run a series of webinars and they've been quite successful. So we've had an average of 117 people attending each broadcast and sort of almost 600 page visits as an average to listen back to those webinars. And those are still up available on the website now as well. Uh, Grass Check GB data has contributed to sort of other technical webinars with research staff and in other areas as well. And we've just started publishing a series of, sort of monthly farmer focus articles. So those are coming out in the Farmer's Guardian and also onto our website. And through those, we're really trying to tell the story of some of our Grass Check GB farmers and how they're using their grass data to really improve productivity and performance on farms and sort of 
just share their stories as to how they've improved their grassland management through the use of their data. So to take a little bit of a look at that data, um, I've got some figures from last year's grazing season just to show you. Um, so through the 2019 season, overall, we recorded an average yield from the grass check farms of 11 tonne of dry matter per hectare across the grazing platform. So that's not including any silage production on these farms, that's purely a grazing yield. Now to put that into a little bit of context, um, many of you listening might well be aware, um, but it's estimated that sort of typical grassland productivity at the moment is sitting around sort of seven and a half to eight ton dry matter per hectare on dairy farms and sort of four and a half to five ton on typical beef and sheep farms. So really demonstrating through the grass check network the kind of yields that are achievable um, using a rotational system and sort of with good grassland management. So within that 11 ton average, there was a significant amount, significant amount of variation sort of with total production between each of our farms. And that's quite reflective of the variation in the farms involved in the project. Um, and that was, you know, we deliberately want to capture this kind of variation. But the absolute range was from 5.4 uh, tonne to 16.7 tonne of dry matter last year. Um, farms were particularly impacted in terms of their yields on the weather they experienced through the season and also on the type of system they're running. So that yield of 5.4 tonne was from an organic farm in the south of England. So absolutely no nitrogen inputs and quite significantly affected by dry conditions in the middle of 2019, um, which really held back their grass growth rates through the summertime. Um, but still achieving a higher than average yield through the system that they're using. And 16.7 tonne was a farm, uh, one of the lowland dairy farms that's reasonably intensive in terms of its production, but sort of a very impressive overall yield. We're also looking at grass utilisation on our farms. Um, so I want to give, give just a little bit of an introduction as to how this is all put together. For all of the grass check GB farms, we calculated their average utilisation above a post-grazing residual of 1,500 kilograms um, dry matter per hectare. And on that basis, we got an average utilisation across all of the farms in 2019 of just under 80%. Now, there are some farms on this chart that are showing very high levels of utilisation, perhaps higher than, than you might expect, but we do have a number of uh, farms within the project that we're actually routinely achieving uh, sort of 1400 and even below post-grazing residuals. So to put everybody on a level playing field, we set a target of 1500 as a sort of typical um, figure that you'd be advising people to aim for because we know that's good for grass regrowth. Um, but some of those higher figures are just come with people pushing lower residuals. Um, quite a broad range in average utilization and I think this, I like this graph because it really shows as an overall average what kind of utilisation is achievable on a, on a wide range of uh, commercial systems in, in GB. Um, but obviously utilisation targets do vary farm to farm and they need to be set in consideration of, sort of other targets on the farm and other, other uh, sort of unique aspects of each system to decide what is an appropriate utilisation target for your farm, for your system, and for your stock. Um, just as an example, for a high yielding dairy cows, there's a, a lot of evidence to suggest that when you start pushing those cows to lower post-grazing residuals, you're gonna start impacting on performance. Um, so you wouldn't expect those, those animals to be achieving post-grazing residuals of perhaps below 1800, whereas beef and sheep guys are gonna find it much easier to hit down to that 1500 figure. Having a bit of a look at what we've seen from 2020. So we're right at the end of the data collection for this season. Um, and I'm gonna have some more individual farm figures coming out over the next couple of weeks as we start to have a better look at the data. Um, but certainly 2020 has brought us some extreme conditions, starting off incredibly wet, um, sort of record breaking wet weather in February, I think. Um, 
and then from the middle of March really becoming extremely dry through the spring and early summer time. And I think if I remember correctly, figures from the Met Office were giving 144% of typical sunshine for GB in spring and only 59% typical rainfall. And you can really see how that's impacted on the grass growth curve here for the first, first part of the grazing season. Um, grass growth rates with the dairy farms in green and the beef and sheep farms in yellow, and then an average value from 2019 in the background in blue. You can see that grass growth at the start of 2020 was significantly below where it was in 2019 with a much more favorable spring. But perhaps most significantly, you can see that in May and into the very start of June, that significant depression in grass growth rates when we'd be typically seeing peak productivity. Um, and that's sort of really impacted on yields from this year, as I'll show you in a second. Thankfully, autumn has been a little bit more typical, um, but we haven't seen massive compensatory growth rates to really make up for that deficit earlier on in the spring and the start of the summer. So from the 2020 figures, we're looking at an overall average yield of 9.5 tonne. Um, if we look at it on a sort of equivalent date basis, uh, we're looking at being 1.4 tonne down on yields from 2019 as an overall average there. Um, and again, you can see on this chart uh, quite a lot of variation on regional figures, just depending on um, sort of specific conditions and, and the weather conditions experienced within each region throughout the year. And to give you a bit of a better illustration, there's the data behind those bars for the regions. And um, these are the regional grass growth curves through the season, comparing growth in 2019 and the blue lines to uh, growth in 2020. And you can see Wales, um, all of our farms in Wales, towards the end of the summer and the beginning of autumn, they really saw quite high grass growth rates compared to last season and compared to the other areas as well. And that's what's really driven them to having the highest overall regional yield for 2020 at 10.6 tonnes. Uh, I'm not sure if I can go back. No. Um, I'm not sure if AHDB can give me a hand going back a slide. And another one. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> not uh, not qualified in technical wizardry, as you can tell. Um, yep. So as well as recording the grass growth data from our farms, um, I've also said we've got the weather stations on site and we're looking at soil data as well. So all of the grass check farms are fitted with a Davis Vantage Pro 2 station um, and an additional soil station. So they have temperature and moisture probes um, and those are fitted at a 15 centimeter depth. So the bulletins that we publish through the season, um, we typically show soil temperature in the shoulders of the season when it's most relevant um, and the soil moisture in the middle of the season. So the soil moisture values go on a scale from 0 to 200 and they're measuring soil moisture tension, so the availability of water in the soil for the plant roots to sort of take it up. Um, and the higher that number is, the more resistance there is, um, and the drier the soil conditions are indicated to be. So a little bit counterintuitive, but higher readings of a drier number. So when we looked at the data from 2019, and we looked at the regional meal, the regional sort of mean grass growth rate compared to the soil moisture values, we saw that um, this sort of peaked around a reading of 60 centibars. And after that, we saw as soil conditions dried, grass growth rates did trend, did tend to uh, decline. So that is very much in line with the manufacturer's recommendations that come with the soil probes to say that readings above 60 centibars, you do get the potential for restricted growth rates there. So when we compare the sort of soil readings that we've seen over the last two years, uh, 2019 is shown on this graph here in the orange line. And we didn't really see extremely dry conditions across the country in 2019. Um, there were some very dry conditions in the south of England through last summer, um, but in terms of a, an overall reading across the whole of GB, sort of peaked around about just under 80 centibars. Um, 
in the sort of springtime and into the summer again as well. Um, but not no significant nationwide soil moisture deficit was seen in that data. But when you compare the blue line, which is the soil moisture readings from our farms in 2020, and this is a weekly average again of all of the farm readings, uh, we see a peak of 140 centibars at the end of uh, May time. So that's really incredibly dry. And actually several of our farms had readings that were topping the scale at 200 for a period of weeks um, through this spring. And that really did um, drive grass growth rates down. And that peak on the soil moisture readings there really coincides with the depression that we saw in grass growth rates in the spring, um, as you can see highlighted on the smaller graph as well. Just to sort of show you how the soil moisture readings are tying in with the rainfall data, um, I said overall the Met Office are estimating about 59% of typical rainfall in uh, spring this year. Um, I've put together these figures on a monthly basis, so showing what Grass Check GB farms have recorded in terms of rainfall and what the 30-year average Met Office figure would be for the whole of the UK for each of those months. Um, I think April particularly. As an average across all of our farms, we saw 8.3 millimetres, which is very, very low um, compared to the typical average of just over 70 millimetres. And if you look at that on the graph here, um, we've got millimetres of rainfall over a week in the bars, and the black line shows sort of how that soil moisture reading rose um, as the soil moisture deficit developed through the season. So quite an interesting relationship between those two figures and in some of the statistics that we've done and uh, we've actually seen that so far with the limited data we've got soil moisture seems to be much more significantly associated with grass growth rates than the rainfall figures themselves do. Um, in terms of grass quality monitoring we have seen um, higher grass quality figures across 2020 as an average than we did in 2019. Um, part of that could well be with a very sunny spring. We saw uh, higher peaks in ME values this year than we did last year. So um, we had weekly averages of uh, over 12 on a couple of occasions, um, just with the very high levels of sun sunlight, allowing uh, sugar to accumulate in the leaves and just pushing those ME values a little bit higher in the springtime. Um, but the overall average for this year has been sat at 11.7. I think the overall range was 11.1 up to 12.2. So really highlighting that despite variabilities and dry matter figures and, and a little bit of variation in the ME, grass is uh, a very valuable forage source throughout the grazing season and something that you know hopefully people can be making better use of. Um, we're obviously this project's continuing for at least another 12 months, hopefully a little bit longer than that. Um, and we're looking at continued data collection through that time, looking at trends in grass growth in relation to the weather data um, and other farm data that we're collecting through the project, and also working on that grass growth prediction model. Um, we are hoping to run some key events um, next season, very much COVID dependent. Um, but what we really want to do through this project is to try and share this data with the wider industry and really um, support the message of, sort of measure to manage when it comes to grassland um, because that really will help you to get the best out of your grazing platforms. And I think uh, figures coming from DEFRA showed that only about 9% of GB farmers um, are currently measuring their grass on a regular basis with a plate meter. Um, but it's interesting, um, the latest farmer focus issue that's come out, we've had one of our sheep farmers from Wales featured in that, and uh, there's a quote from him and his views on taking part in the project. And he sees grass check as being performance recorded grass, for his performance recorded lambs. And I think that's a fantastic view of the project and a fantastic approach to it. And um, it's something that we very much hope uh, would encourage a couple more people to maybe pick up a plate meter, try to get a handle on the numbers and try to get monitoring the grass growth to understand it a little bit better, um, keep an eye on their residuals and really try to make most from that resource that they have. Um, that I think is everything from me. 
happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Catherine. We have already got a few questions come in, but if anybody else has got any questions for Catherine, if you can type them into the question panel, that'd be great. Um, so is there any long term grass tech um, Northern Ireland data available for other researchers to use? Uh, if there is a certain amount published uh, online, the background data behind the grass growth curve is sort of is AFPI data, um, but if you want to use it for a research purpose or a teaching purpose, I'd say um, you can find contact details for us on the website, or I think, um, is my email shared as part of this? If not, I can, um, it's katherine.houston at afbni.gov.uk, so you can drop me a line and we can probably have a discussion about that on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay, thank you. And um, another question from the same person. Uh, will the Northern Ireland grass growth prediction model be published? So the the model was published. Those predictions have been running for about 15 years now. The model was published back in 2005. Um, and the original model was called Grays Grow and it's published by Barrett et al. Um, it's the model that we're using at the moment is very much based on that. Um, there have been a few tweaks and a few changes, and I think as it's tidied up and upgraded over the next couple of months, we're hoping to publish another version, but that, that's sort of, uh, in the pipeline at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, looking at the Grass Check GB map, there doesn't seem to be a monitoring station in the east of England. Are there any plans to recruit farm, um, farmers in that area? Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem is there's not a huge density of um, sort of grazing based farms in that area, um, but we would certainly like to, uh, it's not an area we've excluded deliberately and actually unfortunately we are looking to replace one farm in the project this year and it will be an AHDB funded farm. So if you know someone in that region that would like to take part, let us know, um, we've got an ad, we will be advertising um, recruitment in a couple of weeks. Okay, thank you. So if you've got any ideas and that's your area of the country, then please let us know. And obviously we can guide them in the right direction of when it's advertised. Um, another question, what or have there been any improvement methods seen uh, in the hills and upland grass since the recent trials? Uh, so I think with, our, with the farms involved in this project, um, they're all already quite focused on doing a good job of their grassland management and really pushing their yields. Um, I haven't analysed the data between the two years yet. I suspect we're not going to see anyone improving, particularly on last year's yields, because 2020 has been a much more challenging season. Um, but I think certainly with upland farms pushing yields of over 10 tonne, it it really does demonstrate what is possible when you manage a rotational system well, regardless of your topography and other limitations. Okay. Um, any data on grass growth quality um, on farms will largely rely on the, uh, the grass species. And so I have met a lot of the species, are they generally ryegrass species or is there more data on what species are on which farms? Yeah, so... Um, most of the areas that are being measured as part of this project are predominantly uh, perennial ryegrass pastures with a certain amount of clover included on a number of those. We do have uh, a couple of few pe people that are measuring multi-species swords as well. Um, but the grass quality analysis is being done through an IRS mostly at the moment, so it's not really um, optimised for the multi-species swords just yet. Um, so the data is, is perennial ryegrass only, really, at the moment. Okay, has anybody else got any other questions for Catherine this afternoon? Oh, yeah, another one. Have you uh, any data about the range of yield across the range of the five grass um, site classes, i.e. summer rainfall and clay percentage in the soil? Uh, I haven't yet um i haven't got the farms broken down in into those groupings um 
but it's certainly something we can look at. Okay, well, thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you for giving us the insight into the Grass Check project. Um, and hopefully it's given everybody else a, a really good insight and will encourage some of them to, if they haven't already gone to the website, to go to the website and um, monitor and check what's going on on those different farms across the country um, moving forward um, into next year for the, um, as you say, hopefully it'll be going for at least another year. So um, thank you very much. And thank you. we'll move on to BBD3 and Lorna. So Lorna Grow is, um, is from IHDB. She's in the um, animal health and welfare team as a scientist and she's going to give you an update on the BBD free project this afternoon so without further ado I'll hand you over to Lorna. <laughs> Thanks Katie um, so I'm just going to take you through uh, where the scheme came from why it's important and how we're doing so far. So. Um, so in 2014, after deliberation from the Cattle Health and Welfare Group and following research around cost implications and animal welfare, the recommendation to industry was to create a scheme focused on BVD eradication. And in 2015, the BVD Free England Board was formed. It comprised of an independent chair and a vice chair, as well as representatives from six industry partners, which were AHB, BCBA, Holstein UK, LAA, MBA, and the NFU. Um, although only six sit on the board, there are over a hundred other organizations and companies that have signed a statement of intent to support the eradication of BVD from England. Um, so why eliminate BVD? BVD is an economically impact impactful disease that can have an impact on animal welfare and the environment. We also know the eradication is possible as it's demonstrated by other international in initiatives. And finally, we must coordinate with other national schemes within the UK. Um, this is especially important as once they get closer to eradication, England could hold them back from their ultimate goal. Uh, so as to our first point about economics and animal welfare, all of these symptoms can be caused by BVD, uh, low conception rates, return to heat, abortion, um, having live persistently infected animals in herd, um, and then this can be summarized into the cost. For example, in the case of Bennett et al, uh, they used spreadsheet models to assess the economic impact of non-profit, non-notifiable diseases in farm animals in Great Britain. Estimates of direct cost to livestock production were made and they separately identified the costs associated with disease output losses and those relating to disease treatment and prevention. And they estimated that BVD costs between 25 and 61 million pounds per year. That makes BVD one of the most financially significant endemic diseases in cattle. It's also important to note that that research didn't consider wider economic impacts such as effects on markets, human health and animal welfare, meaning the total could be higher. Uh, further to this, Schmidt van de Limpert uh, et al recently presented through case studies that the use of vaccination on herds with circulating BVD can reduce the effect on milk production significantly. It could therefore be assumed that a herd without circulating BVD could produce more milk. Uh, the links to all of these studies can be found in the information pack that's being sent to you in a couple of days. Uh, another focus in research and public concern has been the effect endemic disease has on the environment and in particular greenhouse gas emissions. In the example of Chatterton et al, they calculated that BVD in beef cattle could increase greenhouse gas emissions by 113% based on 2.2 kilogram increase for every carcass over a baseline 17.1 kilogram in a healthy animal. Uh, this just further shows that less BVD in English herds could reduce the impact on the environment. And so on to international in initiatives. Uh, BVD is a notifiable disease in nine European countries. Um, this is not currently the case for England or any country in the UK. However, other areas are making swift progress on BVD eradication. So Scotland is on phase five of its government run scheme. They currently have legislation in place to restrict the movement of cattle with unknown status or positive status. As of July this year, they had under 150 PI animals alive in Scotland. 
Wales has the only other voluntary scheme in the UK, um, although they have funding from Welsh Government to deliver testing for all herds. Currently, they test, they've tested 8,400 farms, which equates to about 75% of all Welsh holdings. Um, the scheme is hopeful to gain further government backing in the form of legislation in the coming years. And Northern Ireland has 97.3% of their cattle with direct or indirect BVD negative status. Um, and they also have legislated movement restrictions in place. Um, so a bit further afield, the US cattle producers have drafted policy documents um, with the ultimate aim to eradicate BVD from America. New Zealand have moved BVD up their list of priorities, um, which they were planning to get started with, but unfortunately were hit with the mycoplasma bovis issue. Um, but BVD will come soon. Um, and in Norway, no infected farm has been found and no restrictions have been imposed on any farm due to BVD since 2005. And this was followed by Sweden, who has been free of BVD since 2014. I think this demonstrates that eradication is achievable and should be sought after. So bringing it back to BVD Free England scheme and how the scheme works and what it can cost farmers. Our scheme is voluntary and free to join, although we do have a small upload fee um, that we use to keep the national database up to date, to add new features and to run our BVD Free help desk. Um, and our current progress. So as you can see, we have over 6,000 beef and dairy herds already registered with us. These represent over 270 vet practices across the country and cover around 38% of the national breeding herd. We also have almost three quarters of a million individual statuses available on our database. You can see that those herds are split into 42% dairy and 58% beef. Although due to dairy herds being larger on average, our breeding animals are split 60% dairy and 40% beef. When a holding joins our scheme, we have a recommended approach to eradication. We use assess, define, action and monitor or ADAM. And this was developed by Brownlee and Booth at RVC. So assess. During this stage, we ask farmers to think about the impact BVD could have on their holding, what their current risk of bringing BVD onto farm is, and to narrow it down to those main risks are, and then they'll use this to inform their decisions for the coming steps. Um, so on to define. They would move on to defining their BVD status. This can be via herd or individual testing. Depending on the outcome, the far, depending on the outcome the farmer desires. Um, so if they are just moving on to sell, they may choose just to do individual animals if they're trying to gain herd status. Um, the scheme requires the holding to conduct herd testing to then go on to achieve BBD free negative herd status. Um, so option number one is the antigen testing in the form of blood or tag and test for each calf born for a minimum of two years. This tends to be popular in dairy herds that calve all year round and those with smaller herd sizes due to the cost impl implication. Um, so it costs about five pound to include the tag, test and the upload. Um, and the second option is young stock check testing. This consists of blood testing a minimum of five unvaccinated animals um, between nine and 18 months of age um, for antibody. And this is per management group and on an annual basis. So this is the slightly cheaper version for people with larger herds. Um, so they might choose to go down this route. Okay, and then on to action. Um, this will depend on the results of the testing. So either everything came back negative and the holding can focus on planning to keep BVD out, or if a problem was identified, then a PI hunt will be needed. Um, that process is very tailored to depending on the circumstances and um, usually done very closely with their vet. Um, so it would, it would very much depend on the route that they wish to take. It could involve um, lots of pooled sampling or if the herd is small enough, do an individual test on every animal. And then finally, monitoring. Um, so that would consist of continued testing to keep the status out, status up to date, and the continued implementation of tweaking 
of the action plan to keep BVD out of their herd. Uh, once the holding is registered with us and starts testing via our approved laboratories, um, their test results will be available on our central database. Using the website homepage, anybody with a CPH number or animal identification number can look up the animal or herd status. Um, and I'll just quickly take you through what the, what's the statuses are. Um, so if the infant individual, they can be negative. Um, they can presu be presumed negative. So a dam would be presumed negative if a calf tested negative. Uh, they can be positive or they can be unknown. Um, so that'd be due to either not having an individual test or not being part of the scheme. When it comes to herd status, um, they could appear checks accredited. So that's when they've achieved negative with one of the checks health schemes. Um, we can easily transfer that data over from those health schemes so that that accreditation can appear on our website. Um, from completing their two annual or two consecutive years worth of negative testing, they could appear BVD free negative um, or they could be not negative. That could be because they have positives or they may not have completed all of their testing yet. So that covers how we work. Um, moving on to future priorities. In the next few years, the scheme is hoping to reach 50% of breeding cattle covered in England. And I'll come back to stamp it out in a second. Um, we want to secure the support from beef red tractor standards um, to make it a mandatory standard. At the minute, um, there are discussions being had, but we're hopeful that that will come about in the in the new reiteration. And for the dairy standards, it's already been made a mandatory that farms have to have some sort of BVD control from October 2019. Um, we're all, we are also looking to work with new initiatives such as the Animal Health Pathway to support the engagement of further holdings across England. And most importantly, the board hope to gain enough industry and farmer support to go to government to request supporting legislation. And this is essential if full eradication was to be achieved. Um, so I said I'd come back to stamp it out. It, I just wanted to touch on, on this scheme. So this is an RDP funded um, scheme being managed by SAC Consulting. It funds vets to create cluster groups of farmers to discuss and then test each individual farm for BVD. And there's also then further money available if that farm tested positive for PI hunts. Originally, its delivery was scheduled to end in December 2020. However, due to the events of this year, this has now been extended to June 2021. They have currently fully allocated their money, um, but they do still have a lot of delivery to go. And the write up of that work will be available in early 2022. Uh, and the reason that that's important is that the holdings registered under the Stamp It Out scheme can automatically enroll with BBD Free England at the same time. Um, so that sort of helps us get towards our goals. Uh, so as you can see, there's further resources and information available if you're interested. Um, these links are also in the information pack I mentioned earlier. And that takes me to the end. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Lorna. Um, if anyone obviously has any questions on BBD Free, if you can type them into the question panel now. We have already got um, a question that's come in, Lorna. Um, how often would a bee finisher that buys in stores from BBD negative herds have to test um, as they have lots of movements going in and out? Um, so we would work on the biosecurity principle of doing isolation so they could keep their status, um, but just test either before they come on farm or before they then mix with the rest of the animals on farm. OK, that's. Has anybody else got any questions on BBD? Do we know if any of the colleges have uh, taken part and joined up with BBD Free? Lorna? Um, at the moment, we do have two colleges uh, and a couple of universities. So Liverpool's with us, Nottingham's with us at the minute. Um, so yeah, people are engaged and I have done a few um, talks at different colleges and universities in the last couple of years. 
it looks like there aren't any more questions unless uh, if anyone's got one if you type it in quickly and then looks like you've got away lightly yeah this afternoon Lorna with questions yeah no there doesn't seem to be any other questions coming in about in about bbd3 so um thank you very much Lorna and um hopefully the lecturers obviously will take those messages back and um get those points out to the farmers um, of the future so that they can obviously realise the importance of BBD um, and what how the impact that has on on farms, both beef and um, dairy farms. So um, hopefully those messages will get um, taken back to the next generation. So thank you very much, everybody, this afternoon. Thank you again to Ben, Catherine and Lorna for their great presentations and discussions. Um, and thank you to all of you guys for listening. Um, without you, obviously, we wouldn't have any presentations to give. So thank you for giving up your time. Sorry, obviously, it's uh, it's a webinar, not getting you all in person, because I know that you like the interaction and having time to chat with other lecturers from across the country. But obviously, we are where we are, so um, we can't do a lot about that. Um, just a reminder, there is still time to register if you'd like to listen to the Arable Lecturers webinar in the morning. Um, and then the business one tomorrow afternoon, there is still time to register for those. So if you go to the website, um, you'll find the links to register for those. The, you will get a, um, a feedback form pop up when, you've, when we finish the webinar this afternoon. If you could possibly spare a few minutes to fill that in, that would be great because your um, help and feedback really helps us mould what we do moving forward. So. Um, and if you don't have time to do that straight away, I think we will send you an email with the link to that. So if you could do that in the um, in the next couple of days, that'd be great. And just a reminder that this afternoon has been recorded. So if you did need to go back and recap on anything that we've gone through, then that will be available on the HDB webinar page and YouTube um, shortly. So thanks again, everybody. And thank you for listening and hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>